Hi there and welcome to PhD at Living. What was the number one biggest chemical innovation in World War II? Oh wait, it's the atomic bomb, obviously. It's gotta be number one. The real question though is, what's number two? The answer is the improved chemical synthesis of RDX. But that brings up more questions like, what's RDX? And what's synthesis? Then how do we improve a synthesis? All very good questions, and because of that, I'm gonna to have to split this into two different videos. This first segment I'm gonna call a brief history of explosives. Let's begin. It's 1000 diggity AD and black powder is invented in China. It's one of the earliest known energetic compositions and it has three parts. The first is carbon, essentially just charcoal that you grind up to a particle size. Sulfur, again, find it in the ground, and potassium nitrate. You can see in the three-part mixture that we have two different fuels, the carbon and the sulfur, and one different oxidizer, the potassium nitrate. The burning rate of black powder is dependent on the particle size of these ingredients. Well, how small is small? If you look at something like a grade 5FG, very, very fine powder black powder, we're looking at about 150 microns or so. Micron meaning 10 to the negative 6 meters. Now that sounds small, but when you look at an atomic distance, something like the distance between a covalent carbon-oxygen bond we're now talking about single-digit angstroms. Angstroms being a tenth of a nanometer, nanometer being a billionth of a meter. So instead of 10 to the negative 6, we're talking 10 to the negative 10, a full four orders of magnitude smaller than basically the smallest black powder that we have on a usual basis. This is the trouble with black powder, because it's a three-part physical mixture of your fuels and your oxidizer. They can't get close enough to drive the reaction rate to those higher order levels of deflagration and detonation that we see in other energetic materials. Fast forward to the 1840s. It's those halcyon days of organic synthesis where you take nitric acid and add it to, well, pretty much anything. A dozen years are spent and we get things like nitro paper and nitro cardboard, but in 1846, German Swiss chemist Christian Friedrich Schoenbein synthesizes, completely accidentally mind you, but that's for a different video, nitrocellulose. You take this cellulose backbone that has all these pendant OH groups here and essentially just splash nitric acid at it and you convert some of these OHs to the nitrate ester ONO2 group. Theoretically you can convert all the pendant OH groups into these ONO2s, but in practice you generally leave a few here or there that are unnitrated. The great part about nitrocellulose, unlike black powder, is our oxidizer NO2 group and our fuel hydrocarbon backbone here are now linked. Synergy! This is a really critical piece in energetic theory. The covalent linkage between your fuel and your oxidizer allows a molecule like nitrocellulose to access significantly faster reaction rates, leading to more intense chemical reactions such as detonation. The problem for nitrocellulose is it doesn't stay on top for very long. Not one year later, in 1847, Ascanio Sobrero synthesizes nitroglycerin for the first time. This one's much easier for me to draw than nitrocellulose because it only has the three carbon backbone with the three hydroxies here. Much like the synthesis of nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin synthesis pulls off the hydrogens here with mixed nitric and sulfuric acids and adds the NO2 groups. The big difference between nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose, aside from their chemical structures, is that nitroglycerin is a liquid at room temperature. This presents its own series of difficulties, namely that most liquid explosives are extremely sensitive. So sensitive, in fact, that Sobrero didn't think nitroglycerin had a practical purpose, and it wasn't until Alfred Nobel came along, different story for a different day, but made nitroglycerin practical with dynamite. Suffice to say, nitroglycerin is now king of the hill. On the other side of the sensitivity spectrum is probably the most well-known explosive, TNT, or trinitrotoluene. We start with the six-membered benzene ring and add a methyl group to it. Methylbenzene equals toluene. Then we add our first nitro group to give us mononitrotoluene, the second to give us dinitrotoluene, and even though it's a synthetic pain in the neck, the third nitro to give us trinitrotoluene. TNT was first synthesized in 1863 and was originally used as a yellow dye. It was so insensitive that people didn't even really think it could detonate, but when they did find out, oh baby did this get used. Late 1800s, early 1900s, and especially through World War I, TNT was by far the most popular military explosive. 35 years after the advent of TNT in 1898, a German chemist named Henning synthesizes this molecule for the first time, known as cyclonite, or hexogen, or 135-trinitrotriazine. I, however, like to call it plain old RDX. I've read and heard that RDX stood for Royal Demolition Explosive or Research and Development Explosive, but I've also seen that it's a simple backronym that never means anything and it's just plain old RDX, if and in you care about that sort of thing. 
You can see RDX is a six-membered heterocycle with three nitrogens and three carbons, and the NO2 groups are on the nitrogens. This is different from TNT, where the NO2s were on the carbons of that benzene ring. Both of those are different from NG and NC, where those NO2s were on oxygens, all leading to three different classes of nitro structures. Anyway, RDX's main utility in World War II was being mixed with TNT into something called composition, or Comp B. The problem was, we couldn't make this stuff fast enough. And that gets us to the original synthesis of RDX in 1898. Next we'll talk about the syntheses that get us through World War II, but that's for then and this is for now. See you next time. Some men just want to watch the world burn.